Good evening. It's time for us to begin our Sunday evening worship. If you're visiting with us, we'd like to let you know that we're glad that you're here. And we invite this invitation anytime you are able to come. If you do have a noise making device, we would ask at this time if you would silence it or put it on the mode that would not disturb worship at this time. We would appreciate that. In a moment, uh, when Ron comes up, we'll be singing 655. 655. A uh, few announcements that we will make on uh, just a couple new ones, uh, but we will uh, repeat these from this morning as well. Uh, Troy Nations is doing much better. Uh, he's, he's, he's alert and he's awake, uh, so that's, that's a blessing to hear that. Abram Pryor, uh, which is the brother-in-law of Drew and Morgan Delaney, is doing much better. He was let go home today. He was able to go home, so that's a blessing there. So, I mean, continue to get really good news from that point. So let's continue to pray for them and their recovery. Uh, Bob Allen is still at home uh, with uh, blood clots in his legs, so let's con continue to rem remember Bob at this time as well. If you would like to assist with, in disaster relief uh, by, by giving uh, uh, funds, you can make a check payable to the church uh, via Hurricane Ida, or you can get with William Case as well if you are able to, uh, to assist in that effort. Uh, Women of the Word uh, will be Tuesday, September the 7th at 6 p.m. downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. Early risers, September the 7th at 7 a.m. Door knocking for the Ladies' Day will be September the 11th at 9 a.m. Uh, we are currently collecting supplies for the first responders. Appreciation uh, supplies are needed for the uh, first Friday of September the 10th. Uh, we will be packaging bags for the first responders. Appreciation September the 11th. Uh, all the things that they need are in our bulletin uh, handout that we have. Uh, if, if, if you notice, the handout is a little different than we've been using. Derek has redesigned the handout really nicely. Uh, I, hope you, I hope you like the handout. I, re I really enjoy the handout that we have now. Uh, it has everything that's encompassed in one. Uh, you have the lesson for the week, as well as all the information of upcoming events and things of that nature. So give Derek some response. Uh, uh, how do you how do you appreciate that, or you, how do you like it, or what do you? I, I imagine you would appreciate it. So let him know. All ladies are invited to a wedding shower for Courtney Cockroft on September the twelfth, from twelve thirty. Uh, excuse me, from three thirty to five p.m. She is registered at Belts Bath and Beyond. There will be a ladies' day September the sixteenth at nine a.m. We hope all ladies uh, will plan to attend that event. Car Cab Group. Uh, we'll meet tonight after the evening's worship in B1. Uh, Terry Dreyer and Jeff Seals are the car care group leaders, so get in touch with the, those guys or just meet in B1 this morning. Also, if you plan to attend Discovery, Discovery will be September the 11th through the 12th. There's a, a bulletin sign-up sheet in the bulletin if you're, if you're able to attend that event. Okay. Before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh, Father God, we are so thankful, Father, for this day and the blessings you continue to bestow upon us, Father. Father, we thank you that we are able to come out here today, Father, and worship you, Father, in truth and spirit, Father. Father, we hope that and trust and pray that our service here will be acceptable and pleasing and accepting your in holy divine sight, Father. Father, we thank you so much for your loving Son and our Savior, Father, that he was so loving and understanding of a man, Father, that you sent him, Father, that he lived that life as a man, gave us that perfect example, Father. That he died upon Calvary's cross, Father, for each and every one of our sins, Father. Father, before he left, Father, he left us with some instructions on how we should live our lives and things that we should do to follow him, Father. Through your holy word, Father, if we are ever faithful to it, Father, follow it as you have directed us, Father, then we know we can have a home with you one day in heaven, Father. Father, we continue to remember our sick among us, Father. We pray that you continue to bless each and every one of them, Father, what they stand in need of, Father. Father, we thank you for the ones who have made recoveries, Father. We pray, Father, that you continue to look to them as well as they continue to get strength in their bodies, Father. Father, we pray that you will give them things that they need and the ones that are caring for them as well, Father. Father, continue to remember the ones who are suffering through this, this hurricane that we had, Father. We pray that you continue to look to them, Father, for the things that they need, Father. And this, those things, Father, at this time are really basic for them at this time, Father. They need food, water, and shelter, Father. Father, we pray that we continue to look to them and do the things that we can do, Father, to aid them in any way we can. 
Father will continue to do with this country as we continue to go uh, through the COVID crisis, Father. We pray for his leaders, Father, as it directs the, the path to how COVID things are, that are needed for COVID, Father. We pray that as, as we as citizens of this country, Father, we will listen to these things, Father, and aid to them, Father. Father, we pray for our ones who are traveling the highways and byways, Father. There are many of our numbers who are, are traveling the highways and byways, Father. We pray that if you wish your will, Father, that you've given safe traveling grace back to us, Father. Father, we thank you so much for your Son and our Savior. Forgive us when we fall short of your will. And as your name we do humbly pray. Amen. Six fifty five. Wonderful story of love, turn it to me again. Wonderful story of love, waking in mortal strain. Angels with laughter and dancing, shepherds with wonder we sing. Sing the world to me, wonderful story of love.
Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come humble before thee. Thank you, Father, for another opportunity to hear another portion of your word. Dear Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for that sacrifice that he made on the cross for our sins. We thank you, Father, for the church which he purchased with his blood. Dear Father, we want to pray for our elders, our deacons, our teachers, Father, and our ministers, Father. We pray, Father, that they will continue to be encouraged, Father, as they uh, carry out the various responsibilities, Father, that they have to this congregation. Pray, Father, that that you continue to bless this congregation, Father. Pray, Father, that you will strengthen us. I pray, Father, that we will continue to be that beacon of light, Father, in our community, Father, on our jobs. Dear Father, I want to pray for those, Father, that are just recently lost loved ones, Father. We pray, Father, that you will comfort them at this time. I want to pray for the sick, Father, those dealing with cancer, Father, uh, the ones dealing with COVID, Father. We pray, Father, that you will strengthen their bodies, Father, so that they uh, one day can return to that normal health and strength, Father. Dear Father God, we pray that you would be with Gary as he come forth to break the bread of life. Pray, Father, that you would strengthen him, Father, as he continue to labor in that word. Pray, Father, if it be one out there, Father, that haven't obeyed the gospel, Father. We pray, Father, that they will have the courage to come forth, Father, and put on Christ and baptism, Father. Father God, we love you and we thank you for all you do for us. For the Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Invitation song will be 143. Invitation song will be 143. The song before the lesson, number 528. 528. I found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me, he's a fairest of ten thousand to my soul. evening. We've got some on the road for this holiday. We miss them, but we're glad you're here. It's good to be together. Good to be with one another and be able to uh, worship God, sing praises together, as well as open up His Word for just a little while. Take a look at it. Logan kind of uh, joked with me a little bit as I 
he said he's going to see what Neil Pollard has to say tonight. Uh, Neil Pollard's a good friend. Uh, some of you uh, may may have heard of him if you've been to PTP. I know you've 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 heard of him. Uh, he's one of the guys that's up before dawn. Uh, he and I and some others. He runs. I don't run. I walk mostly. Run a little bit, but mostly walk. Uh, but he runs every day. Very very good gospel preacher. Uh, but he's young enough, I will tell you, his first funeral, I was, I was the guy that, that preached it and he worked with me. That's, that's how young he is. And he was in Livingston, Alabama. If you know where that is. Good fella. Loved reading his writings. He wrote a little article and really all he had in it was just some quick pop ideas. And the second I read it, I thought, I've got to, Look at that text, and I've got to think about it. And the reason I wanted to think about it was because we are in a time of struggle. It's right here in front of us. And people, believers in Christ, don't really quite know what to do. They don't know how to handle the whole situation. We then are very, very much like the church at Thessalonica. You know, the... The church at Thessalonica started off, you might say, with a bang. You know, three weeks, Paul went to the synagogue, three straight re- weeks, and preached Christ. That's in the opening verses of Acts chapter 17. Some people obeyed the gospel. Wonderful. But some Jews didn't appreciate the gospel at all. And so they immediately began to stir up trouble. In fact, it does not appear that Paul even was able to stay one month with this young church, these new converts to Christ. Because of that reason, or at least so it seems to me, they struggled. The first epistle to them uh, commends them for good things that they were doing, but they didn't understand everything. Paul had to deal with it. What about uh, people, Christians who die before the Lord comes back? What's going to happen to them? Uh, They didn't understand that. In fact, I think they probably believed if you died before the Lord came back, you were just going to miss out on it. Paul straightens that out with the first letter. With the second letter, he's got to straighten out one other little problem that came out of the first letter. and So it seems to me. In the first letter, he emphasized the resurrection from the dead. And it appears to me that the Thessalonian brethren from that drew the conclusion that the good and the bad would all be raised and we'd spend eternity together. Well, the truth is the good and the bad will all be raised. You look at John chapter 5, Jesus makes that very clear, that both the good and the bad be raised the same hour. He's using that not as a 60-minute uh, span of time, but in the same Immediate time frame is what he's saying. They'll both be raised, but they won't both spend eternity together. And that's really what Paul has to deal with in the opening chapter. He has to try to help them to understand it's going to be okay. They're going to be raised, but they're going to be raised to be punished. You're going to be raised to be glorified. And that's where he goes with the first chapter. When he gets into the second chapter, he goes now on into commendation and encouragement for the Christians. And I title that Hope for the Believer. Look with me, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to focus there. So if you want to put your finger in that spot, I'm going to keep coming back to that same chapter. As we look at it, there are four words that come to my mind. The first word is chosen. Chosen. I love that word. Listen to the way Paul uh, puts it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. God chose you. What does that word 
chose mean to you? What does it suggest to you? When a fellow by the name of Thayer years ago looked at it, he just put it, take to oneself to choose to prefer. So in other words, Paul is saying, you Thessalonian brethren, God prefers you. Now some people have grabbed hold of that and they've drawn a conclusion. And the conclusion is that God preferred some before he ever made the world, and he didn't prefer others, and so some are automatically going to be saved, some are automatically lost. That's not what Paul's talking about. That's not it. Let's go together just briefly to the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul is writing to the brethren of Ephesus. He talks about, in verse 3, you may very well remember that, how that all spiritual blessings are in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. Now watch the next verse, verse 4 of Ephesians 1. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Notice, He chose us where? In Him. You know... <clears throat> Uh, you get invited every now and then to, to these uh, special gatherings, and uh, they're gonna, they're, you're going to go through a buffet line. But there's so many people there that uh, they're not going to let everybody get up there at the same time. They're going to have you choose your seat, and then after you've chosen your seat, maybe this row over here, and then there's a row here, and there's a row over here. Then somebody stands up, the MC, and they say, okay, these folks over here get to go first. And of course, I'm always over here. I don't know how that is, but I always am. Now, was I chosen by name not to go through the line first? No. I was chosen by where I was seated, where I was positioned. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says when he talks about our choosing, God chose those in Christ. And so the big question is, how do I get to be in Christ? I certainly want to be there because I want to be part of the chosen ones. And what we want to recognize before we ever answer that question entirely is this. God wants everybody to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the message of 1 Timothy chapter 2 in the opening verses. It's the message of 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The reason he's not sent the Lord back to end the world is because he's giving us time to repent. Those who may not have done so yet. And so everybody is welcome. The gospel is for all, truly. We sing about that, but that's reality, isn't it? The Apostle Paul preached the gospel to who? Jews, Greeks, bond, free, didn't matter. He preached to all of them. When he writes to the Galatian Christians, he explains how you get to be in Christ then. Everybody's invited, but not everybody comes. So how do you get to be there? The answer is we are baptized into Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 so who is chosen? It's everybody who yields to God in penitent baptism and is therefore added by the Lord of the church. We referenced Acts chapter 2, verse 38 this morning. Look at verse 47, same chapter. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. All the saved are in the church. All the saved are chosen. Once you're saved, you're in the church. Once you're in the church, you're chosen. Because you're in Christ. And that's where the choosing is to be. You want to be chosen? It's real easy. Obey the gospel. He'll put you in the church. and You'll be part of the chosen. So I like the opening word that, that he uses there. The word chosen. But then, not only are we as Believers, the chosen, were also called. Listen to him now as he goes on in verse 14. 
to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word called there is a word that, that describes a calling people into a relationship with God. God wants us to come into a relationship with him. <clears throat> he calls to us. But now how does he call? Every now and then I tell people, well, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the Lord gives me some wisdom or some, maybe through the providence, through the words of somebody else, somebody wiser than me, he's going to help me know what to do, but then I'll say, but he doesn't make any phone calls to me and he's never sent me a text message or an email. He doesn't do that. How does he call you then? Well, doesn't Paul tell us here? He says, called you by our gospel. There it is. How did he call us to be chosen? By the gospel. What's the gospel? According to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That calls us to what? To believe. To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, a confession that we must make if we want him to confess us. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. It's that confession that really the Apostle John wrote his whole book about. So that we would come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so we are called by the Gospel. But for what purpose? Notice the end of the verse there. For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to glory. Don't you like that? Called to be glorified. And it's for that reason that in verse 15, Paul goes on to say, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Stand fast. Why? You've been called to glory. Stay where you are. Hold that position. Hold that spot. Because therein you will find the glory that God wants to give to you. Now, how are we going to remain there to receive glory as a possession? We're going to constantly remember two things. Who we are and whose we are. Look at Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writing to the brethren at Philippi, another one of those churches that he worked with. This one was in Acts chapter 16. And beginning at verse 20, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to, watch this, His glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved, and long for, brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Now, go back and look at a couple of those words. I especially want to start with that word, lowly body. That's a tough translation in the modern day English, because literally translated, it would be the body of our humiliation. You see, when I live in sin, I ought to be humiliated. I ought to be embarrassed. You know, if you read, if you've read the book of Jeremiah any time lately, uh, you know, God basically writes about the, the people of that day through the prophet Jeremiah, and he says they, they basically lost the ability to blush. They weren't embarrassed by things they should have been embarrassed by. Well, if you've come to Christ, then you have realized what? That I, I've lived an embarrassing life. Prior to coming to Christ, you and I lived an embarrassing life. We were guilty of sin. And because of that, we should have been embarrassed by our violation of the will of God and being turned away from Him, the one that loves us, that cares for us. Well, what does he do with the body of this humiliation? He says he's wanting to conform it to what? To his glorious body. We're no longer going to have to be embarrassed because of the way we live, but instead we're going to be in a glorious body. 
Why? Because we're part of Jesus' body. Jesus is glorious. And as a part of His body, we are glorious. Isn't that a beautiful thought? And so we are called to, well, you might really say to glory. We're called by the gospel. And then Paul uses an interesting word. Hold the traditions. Oh boy, I've got brethren that hear that word tradition and, and it's a dirty word to them. They almost spit when they use that word, tradition. Well, <clears throat> the word tradition is a, both a good word and a bad word. It's a bad word if we're talking about things that you and I as human beings have made up and we pass down, you got to do it this way. I can tell you a few places that are like that. Uh, For example, don't dare move the Lord's Supper after the preaching. Because in some places, why, everybody knows, biblically, you got to have the Lord's Supper first. Well, they didn't get that from the Bible. They got that from the previous generation, and maybe the generation before that. That's, if you want to say that, it's kind of the dirty word tradition. It's something that we human beings made up as a law and passed it along that really God didn't make a law out of. But the word tradition also describes the gospel that was handed to men who in turn handed it to others. It's the preaching of the gospel. A tradition handed from one Christian to the to an unbeliever who becomes a believer and thereby becomes a Christian and holds on to the tradition and passes it on. Think about 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul talks about the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There's your tradition, see? You've learned the truth. That's our tradition. You pass that truth on to the next fella and it becomes his tradition And he passes it on to the next fellow. It becomes his tradition. That's the tradition Paul wants us to hold on to tightly. Why? Because we're chosen and we're called. But then also we are, or we have, consolation. That's the next word that Paul uses. Watch him, verse 16. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who loved us, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. <clears throat> uh, the word consolation there is a word that eh, probably if you and I were, were putting it into our language today, we would say encouragement. You ever need encouragement? You ever get discouraged? I marvel sometimes at, at people that think that the way to motivate somebody is to browbeat them and talk about how bad they are. You, usually they're not receptive to that. Now, everybody has to be corrected sometime. I understand that. But if, if it's just that I'm struggling to learn something, I respond better to, okay, that's more like it. Keep going. That's that you know, moves me forward much more so than the other. Well, that's the idea that we have here, that God is offering to us an encouragement. And it's an everlasting encouragement. Why? Because it doesn't stop here. When we go to that heavenly home where our citizenship is, as we read a few moments ago, Philippians chapter uh, 3 and also chapter 4, when we read that, when we go there, doesn't God keep on encouraging us? Won't it be a remarkable encouragement to step into that vast multitude of the faithful who are gathered around the throne and join in in the singing and the praising of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? Won't that be an encouragement? I think it will. And that's exactly what we're looking for. It's interesting that Paul uses that same word in some other places, but the translators don't always use the same word to translate it. So, give you an example. 
Romans chapter 15, verse 4. By the way, brethren, I want to pause just a second and say, don't let anybody tell you that we don't believe in the Old Testament. That, that is not true. We do believe in the Old Testament. Now what I do think about the Old Testament is it's no longer binding on me as a law. But the Old Testament has a remarkable and very important purpose. And that's a part of what Paul's writing about in Romans 15, verse 4, when he says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Guess what? That word comfort in this place is the same word translated consolation in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's encouragement. When you read the Old Testament, do you get encouragement? Well, I do. Let me give you a good example. When life gets rough, when I think, I just don't know if I can make it, you know who I like to read? I like to read Joseph. Sold by his brothers into slavery. They really wanted to kill him, by the way. They didn't do that, but they sold him. Off he went into slavery, and I don't know, there's an impression I have when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask about it, if I'm allowed to ask questions then. And here's what I want to know. Did you think your daddy was coming? Because when he had his firstborn son, you know what he names him? Forgetting. And he says, I'm thankful I've forgotten my father's house. Well, that's interesting. I wonder if he thought, when dad finds out what my brother's done, he's going to come get me. Well, he didn't come. And Joseph went to work for Potiphar. Things seemed to be going great. God's taking care of him, and lo and behold, he gets lied about and thrown into prison. Gets into prison, translates or interprets the dreams because of the power that God gave him. Interprets the dreams of the butler and the baker. Uh, the butler makes him a promise. He says, I'm going I'm to tell Pharaoh about you. Want to get back up there? I'll tell him. Two years went by. How long does it take you to remember something? Two years? That's a long time. And especially in prison. Don't you think that'd be kind of rough? He's forgotten. He's bound to have been discouraged, you would think. But what happens to him? After two years... The butler remembers. And if you, do you notice that God's timing is perfect? If, if the butler had remembered Joseph when he said he was going to, could Joseph have left the country? Well, he might have. But because he was forgotten, he was there when he needed to be there. He interpreted, with the help of God, of course, the dreams of Pharaoh... And Pharaoh appointed him to be, of all things, governor over the land of Egypt, second in command only to Pharaoh. He is given a chariot. Everybody's got to bow down before him, including, guess who? Those brothers that sold him into slavery. <laughs> They're going to bow down to him too. Does that encourage you? Well, it does me. Or what about Job? Job kind of had it rough, don't you think? I mean, he had it really rough. I, I can't imagine losing everything I have, losing my children, and then having so much, uh, so many sores on my body that the only way I can get any relief is take a, take a piece of, of broken pottery and use it to scratch. I cannot imagine. They being like that. But follow the whole book. Does God take care of him? Yeah, he does. He takes care of him. So the Old Testament is there to encourage us. To let us know God doesn't forget his people. He'll remember you just like he remembered them. That's the purpose, or at least a part of it, of the Old Testament. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Because in Hebrews 6 we find... Just a little bit more of that encouragement. But pick up with me, if you will, there at verse, uh, at verse 17. Let's read on down. 
Uh, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Have you just about lost hope? God gives us encouragement. They crucified Jesus. They laid his body in the grave. But what did God do? God raised him up. And where is he now? He is in heaven. Seated by the right hand of God. And he's our anchor right there. We can be encouraged no matter what's going on in our lives. Our anchor's in heaven. And if we'll just hang on, so to speak, to the rope, we're going to make it some way, somehow. So, Paul talks to the believers and says, you're chosen, you're called, you have consolation, and you have comfort. Now, this word comfort that we're going to look at in just a moment is, is somewhat the the sisters of that word consolation. They're very closely related to one another. Listen to what Paul writes in verse 17. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. God is going to comfort us. How? He's going to come alongside us and encourage us to use good words, and good work. And that's going to be the means of our being able to go forward. That's going to be the thing that grounds our heart where it needs to be so that we can go forward ultimately to glory. Look at what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, and see if it doesn't dovetail into this idea that we're looking at. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Why should Christians not use bad words? Why should Christians not tell dirty jokes? The answer is because you and I are supposed to speak in a way that gives grace grace to those that hear us, and then what does it do? Listen to it. It edifies. You know what that word edify is? In the original, it's, it's oikidoma. It doesn't matter if you remember that, but, but essentially what that means is it's house building. It builds up people's houses. It causes them to be strengthened, to be put into a solid position. It is then the ultimate form of comfort. It holds us fast. So God wants to come along beside of us, or more especially, He wants us to come along beside Him so that He can help us go along, be grounded in good words and good works, and the ultimate result will be, well, listen to it. In the, re in the resurrection chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul has assured the brethren over and over and over again, Jesus was raised from the dead, you will be raised too. And he finally says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What we're doing today as Christians, what we do as believers, will one day be rewarded. It's not in vain. It's not worthless. It's not going to go without pay. God is going to give us exactly what we need. 
So right into a church that had to be struggling because of all that went on there, all the difficulties. And they were being tormented and persecuted by unbelievers, including those Jews that had tried to kill Paul. To them, he says, hang on. Hang on, because you are chosen. You are called. You have consolation. You have comfort. If you are a believer and remain firm in that position. So what should we be doing? Well, for those outside of Christ, we've told you you've got to be in Christ to be chosen. If you want to be part of the chosen tonight, you've got to do what we discussed. You've got to be baptized into Christ. Galatians 3.27 But what about for those of us that have done that? A good many in this audience tonight have already done that. What about us? Well, for us, we've got to make sure we stand firm. Isn't that the idea that Paul gave us? Hold fast to the tradition, that is the Word of God, passed from one to another to another, especially in this book that we read and love so well. If you struggle with that, wonderful news. All you got to do is confess, and He's ready to forgive. 1 John 1, 9. If you want what those believers had, it can be yours tonight. Just come while we sing. song will be number 587, number 587. If you're not able to attend the morning service, uh, the communion has been prepared in B1 if you'd like to exit the auditorium at this. I thought Derek was going to come up here and say something. So we'll sing the first and last verse, then we'll have our dismissal prayer. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
we have a couple of uh, things in the foyer we want you to check out. First, if you didn't get a Sunday handout, we tried something new today. So please check that out. Uh, see what you think. Give us your honest opinion, okay? Well, we won't take it personally. It's fine. If you don't like it, tell us that. If you do like it, tell us that. And so we're, gonna, we're trying some, something new. Something else is new in the foyer is house to house, heart to heart. Um, we started in September, sending house to house, heart to heart out to about 3,000 homes within this area. And so uh, we're trying that as an evangelism tool. Uh, so there are copies of that on the Word Supper table out in the foyer. Uh, take one, give it to your friend, uh, leave it with your tip at a restaurant. Do just use it uh, however you uh, would like uh, to reach lost souls. Don't forget, we still are trying to collect contacts and names of people. So if you have friends, if you have family members, um, if you don't feel comfortable doing a Bible study with it with them, call me, call Gary, call whoever, call one of the elders. We'd be glad to assist you in that. We'd love to help uh, study the Word of God with our friends and family. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so glad that we were able to come together today, study your word, sing songs of praise to you. Father, we know that you have blessed us with so many things, this being one. Father, we pray that our service today has been in according to your word and been pleasing to you. Father, we ask if you would to be with all those that we know that are sick. We have a great number. We have some that are due to COVID, due to cancer, due to just age. Father, we just ask if you would be with all of them, be with the ones who were affected by the hurricane. We ask if there's things that we could do to help out in any case, that we'd be made aware of it, that we could help them get through this time. Father, be with us as we leave this place, go to our homes and other places, that we will have a safe trip to the next point in time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.